this song is for you. You can't wear it on your chest, but you can feel it in your heart. And I hope it brings you comfort when this world grows dark. Let it echo through the madness, let the message pull you through. This is our medal of honor to you. And now, Armed Forces Weekly with Donna Lyons on TSPN. Welcome to Armed Forces Weekly. I am Donna Lyons. Mark Major once led a team of soldiers in combat in Iraq. Now he leads a team of railroad employees. The difference? He's not getting shot at anymore. As thousands of American soldiers return to civilian workforce after service in Iraq or Afghanistan, many are finding jobs on the nation's rail lines. More than 25% of all U.S. railroad workers have served in the military. There is a long history of veterans in railroad work. Civil War veterans helped complete the Transcontinental Railroad in the 1860s. But the railroad opportunities are especially welcome now because the unemployment rate for recent veterans remains higher than for the rest of the nation. The Labor Department says the unemployment rate for veterans who have served since September 11th terrorist attacks improved last year but still registered 9.9 percent compared with the 7.9 percent rate for non-veterans. The jobless rate for veterans between the ages of 18 and 24 was even worse, 20.4 percent in 2012. The White House launched a campaign called Joining Forces to encourage businesses to hire veterans. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce led a similar effort called Hiring Our Heroes, partly as a result of those efforts. Businesses have hired more than 125,000 veterans or military spouses, and they have pledged to hire or train another 250,000 more by the end of 2014. But there are up to 800,000 unemployed veterans, and thousands more are constantly leaving the military as combat operations wind down in Afghanistan. Certain railroad jobs are almost perfect fits for certain military jobs. For instance, someone who has an air traffic controller can become a trained dispatcher rather easily. And mechanics who maintain diesel equipment in the military can use those skills to take care of locomotives. Skilled trades such as plumbing and electric work are all needed in the railroads. Even veterans who don't have special skills are still a good fit because railroads are willing to train them to be conductors or to do other jobs. Railroads pursue veterans by attending dozens of job fairs every year employing recruiters who are veterans and offering classes for veterans to help them apply for civilian jobs. Right here in Amador County on May 27th, Hospice of Amador and Calveras wants to share its commitment to increase veterans' access to compassionate, high-quality hospice care for those who are facing serious and life-limiting illness. As part of this commitment, Hospice of Amador and Calveras is a part of an innovative program called We Honor Veterans. They are equipped to address the unique needs of our vet nation's veterans. They know it's important to create a trusting environment for veterans to share their experiences and understand that each veteran views their service in a unique way. This is one of the reasons Hospice of Amador and Calveras is devoted to developing a veteran-to-veteran -veteran volunteer program which aims to pair veteran volunteers with hospice veteran patients. It surprises many Americans to learn that every day 1,800 veterans die. That's more than 680,000 veterans every year, or 25% of all the people who die in this country annually. A generation of World War II and Korean War veterans are facing end-of-life care decisions now, and they are quickly being followed by younger Vietnam War veterans, many of whom are confronting serious illnesses at an even earlier age. If you know a veteran who is in need of hospice care or you are interested in the Veteran to Veteran Volunteer Program, please contact Hospice of Amador and Calveras at 223-5500 to help our local veterans. Dan Reardon, who is the Executive Director, will be on Armed Forces Weekly on June 11th to talk about the program and other things happening with Hospice of Amador and Calveras right here in our community. Recently, a retired Air Force Colonel, Bill Talley, spoke out about life as a POW. The retired Colonel spoke of the filth and torture that POWs endured during his 11 months in the camp in Vietnam and the courage exhibited by his fellow American soldiers. He talked about the really brave men who survived the prison camps, some of them for years. His talk, enhanced by more than 30 photos and slides, brought a standing ovation from the crowd. 
Tally demonstrated the tap code and the phonetic way POWs spelled out their messages. He said they were texting messages 45 years ago without mobile phones. Communication was vital for morale, but it was against camp regulations. Violating the rules brought punishment, sometimes brutal. Handcuffs, leg irons, kneeling on broken glass, and being forced to hold up your arms for long periods of time. He spoke of Robbie Reisner, a POW for seven and a half years who spent more than four years in solitary confinement for leading worship services. As Reisner was led away, Bud Day began singing, God Bless America, and the rest of the POWs joined in. He said, Mike Christian made an American flag from a dirty old rag he found. He was beaten after guards found the flag. But it didn't stop him. He later found another rag and began making another flag. He said the stars and stripes, our national symbol, was worth the sacrifice. Talley's story began in 72 when he was stationed at McConnell Air Force Base. He was home after 10 months in after being in Thailand. He flew a 169 combat missions on two tours. Talley was deployed again to Southeast Asia. On his 13th mission of the temporary duty, the jet fighter he was piloting was shot down over Hanoi. He bailed out, landed injured, but alive, and hid under a rock on the side of a mountain until he was captured a day later. After three days of walking through villages where he was kicked, hit with sticks, pelted by rocks, and spat on, he rode in the back of an army truck for hours before being checked into the POW camp known as Hanoi Hilton. POWs were held in solitary confinement where nightly interrogations meant to influence POWs to tell the press they were humanely treated and write anti-war letters. Tally was among those who refused to comply, and after two months, the North Vietnamese announced Tally had been captured. Word finally reached home that he was alive. The wives could send cards and packages, but most were withheld. He said you could always tell when a package arrived. The guards smelled like aftershave lotion. Tally said everything can be taken from a man except one thing, freedom to choose one's own attitude in any given set of circumstances. We are not the master of our fate. God is. As many people know, five months ago, Army Sergeant Brandon Morocco's arms belonged to someone else. Morocco, who was blown up in 2009, is the first soldier to receive a double arm transplant and only the seventh successful recipient in the United States. He still doesn't have any physical sensation in his hands, but he manages pretty well. Doctors estimate it could be two years before he gets feeling all the way down to his fingertips, as nerve tissue regenerates about an inch a month. In December, a team of 16 surgeons at Hopkins attached two cadaver arms to Morocco in a 13-hour operation that started at 1 a.m. His remaining nerve muscles, bones, blood vessels, and tendons in his upper arms were intricately connected to the donor arms. And eventually, as the nerves come to life down the arm, the limbs will move like they were his own. The rehabilitation process is long, grueling, but doctors said Morocco has so far beaten every timeline expectation. Morocco said trading in his prosthetics for the transplanted arms meant taking a step back in what he is able to do. Last year, he shot a gun with his prosthetic hands on his annual hunting trip. Of the successful bilateral arm transplants done in the U.S., the hospital reported that Morocco's surgery was the most complicated and extensive ever. The hospitals is forging partnerships across the military to educate both patients and doctors about the chance for amputees to get non-prosthetic limbs. About a month and a half ago, Department of Veterans Affairs Secretary Eric Shinesky visited the hospital and expressed interest in covering the cost of rehabilitation for vets who undergo the procedure. The surgery isn't covered by the military insurance TRICARE, so Hopkins and the Armed Forces Institute of Regenerative Medicine footed the bill for Morocco's surgery. The doctors donated their time. Morocco will move to Walter Reed for the rest of his rehab. He said his new arm gives him hope for the future. While he has waited for a donor, he didn't make any plans. Now he started to plot out the next few years of his life. On tap for this year, pulling the trigger with his new hands during his hunting trip in November. About a month ago, everyone watched as the Marine Corps' newest mascot, Chesty 14, was made a full Marine. Chesty wore his uniform beautifully, walked with undeniable charisma and a bit of boldness as he approached General James Amos. Then he stopped. General Amos barked the order, recruit Chesty for the last time, report to the commandant of the Marine Corps. Refusing to walk up to the general, even after being ordered for the last time, he was picked up and carried. You may be asking why a recruit would be carried. 
Well, Chesty is a bulldog. General Amos, commandant of the Marine Corps, promoted the young bulldog from recruit to private first class and pinned on him the services symbol, the eagle globe and anchor. Throughout the entire ceremony, Sergeant Chesty 13 barked loudly and signed, according to Marines watching the ceremony, that the bulldog was upset about no longer being the center of attention. However, General Amos finally offered Sergeant Chesty 13 a ringing endorsement, telling the audience that the strong bulldog had gone nose to nose with Leon Panetta's golden retriever, Bravo, who growled and tried to intimidate the higher ranking pooch. Panetta's dog backed down. Senior defense officials have warned that the new Chesty should be cautious of Chuck Hagel's dog, Figgy, who is a Portuguese water dog. He might not be as quite as demure as Bravo was. The Marine Corps' mascot tradition dates back to World War I, when German news had called the attacking Marines devil dogs. Later, a recruiting poster portrayed a snarling English bulldog wearing a Marine Corps helmet. The Marines love it and officially unadopted the bulldog as their mascot in 1922. In the late 50s, the Marine barracks in Washington, the oldest post in the Corps, became the new home for the mascot and renamed Chesty to honor the legendary Lieutenant General Louis B. Chesty Puller, Jr. As for the senior Chesty, when his service is done, he will retire and live permanently with his sponsor family, a Marine who plays in the United States Marine Band. The newest addition is doing well at learning his new job at Friday night parades, taking place at 8th and I, and will soon take over. That is until Chesty the 15th comes along. We are going to take a commercial break, and when we come back, we will meet my guest, Gina Woods. You're watching Amador County's local television network, TSPN.